Welcome into this edition of the Golf Central Podcast presented by Callaway Golf. I'm Lav, soon to be joined by Rex. And folks, this is the season-ending edition. Always bittersweet as we look back on the year that was. And so we are handing out awards to players, even some tournaments and some meals for the 2022 <sighs> golf season on the PJ Tour since that is what Rex and I primarily cover. We'll get into the best player, best newcomer, biggest disappointment. Of course, we'll get into all of that. And we'll also do some fun ones, too, from our year on the road. But first, Callaway has developed their longest irons ever in the Rogue ST line. These irons are breaking ground with a high-strength 450 AI face cup that's never been seen before in the industry. Callaway has continued to push innovation through their patented urethane microspheres and have massively increased their precision tungsten weighting. The Rogue ST lineup is available in four options to suit every type of player including the Rogue ST Max for incredible speed, forgiveness, and performance. They're available now, and for more information, visit CallawayGolf.com. Rex, since this is now not just an audio medium, but a visual medium, shout out to the Georgia Bulldogs, who in a couple of days will be taking on Ohio State in a highly anticipated semifinal of the college football playoff. I do hope that you had a wonderful Christmas. Based on the sound of your voice, uh, it is clear that you got deep in the bourbon. Yes, yes, deep in the bourbon, deep in the IPAs. It was a terrible idea. It's a tradition unlike any other. No, uh, it, it was a good Christmas because anytime uh, we we go through this, so my family spends Thanksgiving in New Orleans at other people's houses, and you're kind of moving around. The 400 and, person Thanksgiving, yes, yes. Whereas Christmas is just more, just kind of us. So it's much more enjoyable. Much more enjoyable, and you sound. Positively oh. dreadful I know. for this final podcast of the year. So Rex, this is actually I think my like most favorite podcast that we do the entire year. We do fifty two podcasts, uh, and of course we also have a couple of emergency ones as well. In addition to Rex, beginning in twenty twenty three, this is going to be happening. The post major round emergency pods, fifteen to twenty minutes. You you people ask for it, we will deliver it. So yes, we will definitely have more than fifty two podcasts. In the calendar year 2023 but i love this podcast it's the nostalgic of me uh looking back on the year that was and so let's just begin with the big one when we're handing out awards for this we're talking player of the year you and i are both members of the golf writers association of america we had to lodge our vote for male player of the year who was your selection and why uh, well, before I give my selection, I just want to you know, give a peek behind the curtain and, and just let you know how the production value of these podcasts, you talked about 52. I think we did one every day during the Open Championship and during the Majors, so it's 52 People plus. were loving it. 50, I know. People were loving it. The production value was you texted me 15 minutes ago and asked, are you ready to do the pod? Yes. Do you want to do to, you know some sort of awards? Sure. What are you thinking? And five text, text exchanges came up with our list. So yes, the high production value of our podcast is... Hey, do you want to talk about this? Sure. And apparently you've done research. Is that right? A little bit of research. I fired off a couple text Some messages. Reporting? Being, being, being the reporter that I am. Uh, I mean, the production value is certainly not, not high. This is where we've we've just transitioned to this uh, visual medium just over the past month, uh, something that other podcasts have been doing for years, literally years, uh, but uh, baby steps. But look, Rex, we are one of the most listened to podcasts under the NBC Sports umbrella. Like, we are absolutely okay. killing it. Uh, despite right. our lack of production. That is a long way of saying your player of the year is Rory McIlroy. And as you pointed out, we're members of the GWAA, and you and I have had this conversation now probably for the last, what, three weeks, four weeks now? At about least. who should... Yeah, who should be on the ballot. So it was very straightforward, actually. It was Scotty Scheffler, Rory, and Cam Smith. And I actually had a hard time coming down between Cam Smith and Rory McIlroy. And it's, look, this goes beyond the golf course. We know that. Like, Cam Smith going to Live Golf after winning the Open Championship. Rory being so outspoken against Live Golf. They were sort of right at the middle of this. Look, you could say Phil Mickelson is the face of Live Golf. But I think Cam Smith sort of took on that mantle as the highest-ranked player that the Breakaway League was able to secure. All those things being said, I think what Rory did both on and off the golf course for the entirety of the year, if you look, go back and look at his record, he, he played well in the majors. He played well in the spring. He played well in the summer. He finished out the season strong. He won the DP World Tour season-long title. He won the FedEx Cup. I can keep going on and on. I, I just think he's the player of the year. Roy McIlroy played the best golf in 2022. Statistically, that is indisputable. However, my player of the year, on the men's side at least, 
is Cameron Smith, the aforementioned Cameron mm-hmm. Smith. The reason I chose him as my GWA Player of the Year, the, and it wasn't just the quantity of his wins, which was five. To me, Rex, it was also the quality of his wins. You look at the season opening, the lid lifter at Kapalua, record performance, 34 under par, outdueling then world number one, John Rahm. That was obviously sensational. The Players' Championship, we're going to get into it, of course, on this podcast and the, the the finish that he had to that tournament against what is literally the strongest field in golf. He was in the final group, remember, Sunday at the Masters, even though he had somewhat of a forgettable final round at Augusta National. And then he, he continued that play throughout the rest of the year, the Open Championship, a back nine thirty at the old course at St. Andrews, one of the best uh, back nines we have ever seen in major championship history. And if you're giving credit for Roy McIlroy for kind of shouldering the burden Right of being the tour spokesman, I, am. I actually I actually give Cam Smith a, a, a tip of the cap as well. He made a career altering decision that certainly could have led him off course with his game. He had every reason then to kind of take off the accelerator, but he did win uh, against forty seven other players in a live tournament, and then at the end of the year he won in Australia. So he won the the first tournament of the year on the PGA Tour. And he won one of the final tournaments of the year in Australia. So Cam Smith is my player of the year. Although I do, I, I got to say, Rex, I'm not sure how many of my fellow golf writers are going to vote him. As It'll player be interesting of the year, vote. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Like I, I think you're going to be on the losing end of this, not because I think anyone's going to hold the live equation against uh, Cam Smith in this particular situation. I think it's going to be the opposite. I think they're probably going to hold it against Rory and pick Scotty Scheffler because Scotty just sort of focused on the golf. And if you look at what he did in the spring, it was pretty impressive. But it, it will be an interesting vote. Yeah, I, I think we have vote totals for that. I'm not totally sure, uh, but I hope so. Maybe, not yet. I could, I could have the only vote uh, for Cam Smith, uh, but I am steadfast in my belief that he was actually the best player in 2022. Let's move on, Rex. To best newcomer, a couple different directions we could go with this one. Who's your best newcomer for 2022? I think this is probably going down the list. I think this is the only one you and I are going to pick the same. If I, as I studied the list, I'm thinking this is the only one because it's got to be Tom Kim, right? I thought about, I mean, Cameron Young is, was an impressive addition to the PGA Tour landscape, and I think he's going to be an extremely impressive player. But man, what Tom Kim did, just the personality, what he did at the President's Cup to light it up, to win twice. On the PGA Tour, you didn't like the, you didn't like Tom Kim's antics at the President's Cup. If memory serves, no, that's not right. I, I didn't like the idea that we just wanted to anoint him, sort of the next best thing. Crown him, the next, crown him. Just be done with it because he had one good. I, I think. I mean, to be fair, he had one good Saturday afternoon at the President's Cup. I don't want to take anything else from him. I just felt like, okay, like we got a little breathless over him at the President's Cup, but I still think it's it, it was an impressive performance at the President's Cup. I love the energy. I love the personality. So. Uh, you and I have been friends for too long uh, because I knew that you were going to take Tom Kim. And so in the interest of this podcast, I was like, I better come up with another name besides Tom Kim, who I think is is an obvious selection for that. He's now 15th in the world. He's uh, the first player since Tiger Woods to we literally win, had 15 win minutes twice before this before the age of 20. Podcast. But, but I was like, Rex is going to pick Tom Kim. And so I pivoted and went in, in a different direction. And Rex, I chose your boy. Sahith Thigala, former uh, uh, player of the year in college golf, had a a decorated career at Pepperdine that was unfortunately cut short. We actually don't know what Sahith Thigala could have done that year. It was the year that was cut short uh, by COVID in 2020, still won three times. Took him a little bit of time to get out on the PGA Tour, and once he did, Rex, I I was really impressed with what I saw. It wasn't just his game, uh, which is really fun. He is an erratic driver of the golf ball, to say the Mm -hmm. least but has some great hands, is a fantastic putter. And he had a couple of chances to win, certainly the Phoenix Open, which was kind of like his coming out party, um, and definitely had a chance to win as well as the Travelers Championship. It kind of gave that one away on the 72nd hole, allowing Xander Schauffele uh, to step in and win that tournament. But for a rookie to make it all the way to the Tour Championship, as Cameron Young uh, also did, uh, I think uh, Sahith Thigala, with his personality, uh, with his game, could certainly be on the Cup team, the Ryder Cup team, in 2023. And I think he's uh, fast becoming a fan favorite just because of his uh, honesty, his accessibility, his his perspective on things. He doesn't take it all too seriously, although he's incredibly dedicated 
to his craft. I'm just a big fan of Sahith in general, uh, and I think that 2022 uh, was the start of many things to come. Well, and I don't even know how healthy he has been since he left Pepperdine because I mean he's dealt with some wrist injuries if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly. So I think yeah, he's he's had he's had that issue for for years. Yeah. So it's a you know to sit and think what he could become. You're right. The personality is fantastic, and his golf is is right there behind it. Best shot. I have a number of options listed here, but I'm curious which direction you want to go with best shot that that we ha- that we saw either in person or on television this year in 2022. I did not see this in person. And it's funny, our colleague, Doug Ferguson, with the AP, he does this year-ending story, which I I think is very cool. I have major FOMO every year when he starts to do it, that he came up with this concept of doing the best club with the, for the best shot on the PGA Tour all yes. year long. And it's the putter through the driver. And it's interesting, and he does a lot of research. He does a very good job. Check that story out. But the one that he to- we talked about that he wasn't sure if he was going to lose, it was the 7-iron that didn't even hit the green. It was at number 8 at Pebble Beach during the third round, and Jordan Spieth hits it, ah. so it should be nothing whatsoever. He's hanging on that cliff. I still I had to go back and because I wanted to do something in my year-ending awards column just about this, so I wanted to watch the shot again. My hands started, so I got I got nervous just watching him hit the shot again, and, and I have since sort of talked to some people in Jordan's re- universe and how shaken, not just he was, after he hits the shot, we've all kind of seen from, it. From not. the cliff, it's the eighth hole. He sort of, everyone, uh, everyone saw yes. he, he was dangerously close to the cliff. Like, if he lost his balance, he was tumbling 500 feet down to his death. I mean, from what I was told, he and his caddy, Michael Grella, were emotional about it after the round. I mean, because they realized that I, I really should not have done that. It, and it was so dangerous that in, in the research I was doing earlier this week about it, Pebble Beach won't even let you get close to that cliff anymore. They put up sort of a temporary fence. You can't go up and play shots. So they don't even want people to try them because it's ridiculous. You're going to tumble down the cliff. Uh, that that moment, Rex, and, and I'm I'm a I'm a Jordan Spieth fanboy. Uh, have have long been you were so scared. since his U.S. Junior. Yes, I was I was scared for him and for his extended family. But I think that that moment just Doing under some pearl clutching, watching it on TV. <laughs> no, oh God, no. But I I do think Rex that 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 moment underscores why we love watching Jordan Spieth so much. The the fearlessness the artistry, the creativity, the imagination. Um, it always seems like, well, this time he actually was, like he's just like teetering on the edge of disaster. And you don't know whether he's going to pull off something brilliant or he's going to absolutely crumble as he did at the 2016 Masters. I think that's the beauty of Jordan Spieth and why uh, he is as popular as he is. That is a great call. Best shot for Jordan Spieth. I have a number of them, and so I'm going to list right. them off with the grand finale. Right, make so, it Hideki, so Hideki Matsuyama's three wood at the Sony Good Open way. was unbelievable. Hit it to three feet for eagle, won that tournament. Cam Smith's up and down, 72nd hole after inexplicably pitching out and into the water on the home hole. Ended up getting up and down. I would actually give honorable mention then to uh, the road hole save uh, on uh, the 71st hole of the Open Championship as well. Sky Scheffler's chip in on the third hole, final round of the Masters. Justin Thomas, second playoff hole, the three-wood onto the green, two-putt birdie to seal his second major championship. But the best shot, and the, I, I think it's actually obvious. You went a, a cool direction, I think, with Jordan Spieth. But the obvious answer for the best shot in 2022, because it wasn't just the best shot of the year. It's one of the best shots in major championship history was Matt Fitzpatrick out of the fairway bunker, 155 yards, 9-iron. Eight iron, iron, right? The 72nd hole, 9-iron, nine nine iron. Iron, 72nd hole. Uh, at the country club, uh, clearing that lip, also clearing uh, the green side bunker, plopping that 15, 20 feet behind the hole uh, was an incredible shot. Fairway bunker play is actually one of Matt Fitzpatrick's greatest weaknesses. And for him to hit that squeezy fade, the shot of his life, I remember Will Zalatoris' playing partner called it a 1-20 in 20 shot, uh, was, was epic. One of the best clutch shots uh, we have ever seen in major championship history. So for me, that was a, a faraway winner. That was good. Yeah, and I think if a memory serves, there was a kind of some tree trouble as well. Like, not only did you have to worry about the lip, not only did you have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, picking it cleanly, but I think there was actually a tree that he sort of no had trees. to go, no go trees. under and around. It was a weird... It was the left side of the fairway. Uh, I mean, there were trees. That was way far left. It was a weird okay. stance where the ball was above his feet, and there was a lip that was, like, protruding. So he, he had to get it up quickly. He had to pick it absolutely perfectly, clear basically two lips, and then also... Uh, the greenside bunker, just an absolutely 
epic shot. Yeah, that it was good. one that netted Matt Fitzpatrick his first major championship. How about biggest surprise, Rex? I don't know if you want to go situationally here or player-wise, but biggest surprise in 2022. I went with player wise and it's Scotty Scheffler because if we were having this conversation at this time last year, we did have probably... this conversation and you picked Scotty Scheffler for a breakout year. Thank you very much. I don't, I, but I did not anticipate that breakout. When I was thinking breakout, I thought maybe he'd win a tour event, maybe two <laughs> tour events, maybe he'd make the president's gonna, cup team. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to win the Mexico open. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think that this was where he was going to end up and it happened so quickly in the spring. And I think you and I had this conversation after he won the masters. I mean, you covered him a lot in college. You knew him a lot better than I did. And junior I think golf. even, yeah, way back to his junior golf days. And I asked you point blank, did you see this coming in, in your rare moment of honesty? Even you had to admit that, no, I did not see this coming. No, absolutely not. I mean, it'd be revisionist history to look back and say, oh, boy, this guy was destined for greatness. Of course, he was going to rip off four wins. Put a green jacket on him including... when he was at the Doral Jr. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I, I did not. I think I think in hindsight, like he clearly had the pedigree. Uh, you don't you don't win a U.S. junior. You're not the number one ranked junior in the country. You're not uh, a college All-American uh, just by kind of fluking your way around. Did I think he could win a major? Definitely. Sure. I thought he could be a top 10 player in the world. He certainly had that pedigree. But to spend 30 weeks as the world number one, uh, to, to win a major championship and basically three other what are now elevated events on the PGA Tour, that was an epic run. And I don't think he's going to necessarily fall off in 2023, although I do think it will be difficult to replicate. That's a very good call. I went kind of big picture. And the biggest surprise to me, Rex, was the animosity that we saw among the global golf landscape. That extended from the tours and either Commissioner Jay Monahan or DP Chief Executive uh, Keith Pelly. It extended to the players, you know, kind of the old guard with Lee Westwood and Ian Poulter and Sergio Garcia to even some of the younger players, whether it's Roy McIlroy, who's, you know, in his early 30s, uh, Justin Thomas, even, you know, Sahith Thagala uh, kind of took offense to some of the barbs that the live players were throwing their way. I find I found that very surprising. I knew it was obviously going to be a divisive issue. You don't look just look at the uh, Saudis human rights record and think um, that, that getting in bed uh, with that sort of murderous regime is going to go over well when they're literally trying to take over a sport. But I guess I was a little bit surprised that that extended all the way down to the players, not just with the antitrust lawsuit, but then the countersuit. There's the case, uh, the trial uh, that's set for February uh, in Europe. Like, it's just really messy. I knew I knew there was going to be, I guess, some level of animosity, but, but how it is completely uh, destroyed uh, the elite men's game was a little bit surprising to me. No, that's a good one. And I did this story just a couple of weeks ago about how it fractured so many relationships on tour. And, and man, it, I feel like I'm wearing Christmas right now. Like, it, it, my voice is awful. Do I, do I look like what, Christmas? Like, what did you do? Besides, uh, I didn't. Besides, besides get COVID, RSV, and the, the flu, and I don't know. alcoholism yeah, the, all, in, all, in one, all in one day. Normally, I, I would own, you know, that was, you know, three, four too many IPAs, which is causing this. I think I actually have a cold, but it double. could very well be three or four too many IPAs. <laughs> it, it really could. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't be the first Just time. Just wearing I, it. Just wouldn't wearing be the first Christmas time right that that happened. Thank God we're wearing hats because uh, you looked uh, even worse uh, without one. How about best tournament, Rex? I do believe we're going in the same direction for this one. You think so? I think so. Uh, yeah, pro probably, because in, this one's always tough, because, I mean, you, you and I both go through this with our friends. Like, everyone thinks that the Masters is the coolest place to go to, and I'm not saying it's not the coolest place to go to. It's one of those places that after, and I think you spend 10 days there, 12 days there, however, you spend a fortnight there uh, just because of your duties, it, it starts to wear on you. Gus, the National Women's, women's Amateur Stand Up. Yep. Yeah, that's it. So after like 10 days, it starts to wear on you. It, the one that I'm going, always going to go to is an open at St. Andrews. And it, it, the outcome sort of factored into this as well. I love the idea that it sort of came down to those two players towards the end, and Cam Young in the mix as well. But anytime, I mean, let's let's face it, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves at St. Andrews. It's just a special place. It is, it's almost like it was built to host a major championship. So that's always going to be at the top of my list. Yeah, uh, our boss, Mercer Bags and I um, had a little bit of a travel snafu. We were supposed to join you at the Scottish Open. Those, uh, mm -hmm. That reservation 
never was made. And so we headed early over to St. Andrews, and he and I uh, were getting beers on uh, the rooftop bar of the Rusex. And nice. that is when we saw Tiger Woods. Let me, pick, let me pick that up for you. He dropped that. There you go. Yep, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> and we saw Tiger Woods and Justin Thomas uh, head out for the practice round. That was really cool. We walked the entire 18 hole practice round with Tiger on Sunday, which really set the tone for what I thought was, uh, I agree with you, the Open Championship was the best tournament of the year. I, I thought it was a week unlike any other. It, it wasn't just, it wasn't just like the precursor. It was the Champions Challenge, which I thought was really cool on Monday. We had some testiness in uh, the uh, media press conferences earlier in the week with, with, with Tiger being more open and honest and transparent than he has been basically in his entire career about what he thought uh, of the decision uh, for some of those live defectors. And then the, the actual tournament was awesome as well with Roy McIlroy, Victor uh, Hovland, staking themselves to a 54-hole lead, seeing the angst on uh, my fellow golf writers' faces uh, while preparing <laughs> to potentially write a Roy Why? McElroy win at the 150th Open at St. Andrews, breaking an eight-year winless drought uh, was was certainly fun. There's there's talk of like a couple golf writers going to like old Tom Morris's grave to get like inspiration uh, for their final round gamers, uh, and all of it, of course was for naught with Cam Smith's epic final round 64 and Roy McIlroy's just dis- dispiriting uh, 18 green in regulation final round 70. So from start to finish, and even before the tournament, the first two days uh, before the tournament actually be- began, the 150th Open was definitely a highlight for me. Going, we just walked around St. Andrew. Shout out Bunkmate. We had a great time uh, housing her in our flat in St. Andrews. Uh, so that one was a no-brainer. Rex, how about in the non-major division? What was the best tournament either you covered or that, that you watched this year? This is, a, this is, if I'm being honest, this is the one I'm not the most comfortable with because I could start going through the list, and as I pointed out, we had 15 minutes of production here to get ready. <laughs> I, as I, you immediately start going through your mind and you start remembering the cool tournaments of the year and some of the cooler finishes. But the one, and this is probably a recency bias on my account, but the tour championship. The, R- the RSM Classic? Uh, well, yeah, that's always at the top. That's the fifth major, though, so I couldn't count that as a non-major. You see what I did there. Um, I, I love the idea that it, that it came down to, to Scotty was sort of clinging. He, he was not playing his best Six shot lead. He had a six he had shot a, lead. He, and he was this, was, this was a snooze. This was a yes. snooze fest on Saturday afternoon. And, and again, sort of in the bag for Rory on this one, but it seems to be such an apropos way for the PGA Tour to end their season that that, that guy, of all the guys, if it's not going to be Tiger Woods who's coming off the bench and limping onto the court, that in this particular case that it was Rory, I, I felt like like Jay Monahan could not have got a better assist. Uh, I would agree with that. Like some of these some of these terms, when you think about it, like from I, I think our our perspective can be skewed by if it's a great Sunday, right? Like was was that a great tournament? Or was that a great Sunday? Or was that a great final hour? So, like, uh, you could have thrown the PGA Championship in there, which I thought was kind of sleepy, right? Yeah, like Mito Pereira, Matt Fitzpatrick, dueling it out, and then it got really tight. We in the booked the wrong hotel. Hole. There's no well, way I'm doing the PGA Championship. You and I booked true. into the wrong hotel. Yeah, that was that was a that was a personal personal snafu uh, on 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 your part. Like, I thought. I thought the Memphis tournament had a great ending, right? Like the, the playoff with Will Zalatoris and Sepp Straka was very entertaining. You had the melodrama of the Cam Smith playoff when he had a chance to get to world number one with all the rumors pick of one. him defecting. And so my pick, and I actually can't believe you went, didn't go this direction, was the President's Cup. The President's Cup is not a major championship, and that was great. We look forward to these team events each and every year. We all knew that the, the President's Cup was going to be lopsided in favor of the Americans, and it certainly looked that way, right? After Friday, it was 8-2, to two, and then all of a sudden on Saturday, I thought Saturday was the best day of the tournament. It got really close. Internationals led by Tom Kim, the aforementioned Tom Kim, breakout star Tom Kim, uh, added a, a lot of uh, drama to the proceedings. You had Scotty Scheffler putting in the dark. You had the Americans uh, super pissed off in their team room on Saturday. And there was a moment, Rex. It was a. It, it didn't last long. It was maybe thirty minutes, maybe forty-five minutes. Mm. But there was act. But there was actually a moment on Sunday where the door was open 
for the internationals mm. to win the president's cup when it looked like that wasn't even feasible it was incomprehensible about 48 hours earlier so the president's cup to me even though we all knew it was eventually going to be a five-point american win those team events we get to see players in a different light we get to see players uh come up with clutch performance we get to see unlikely heroes i absolutely love team events and i'm sure the Ryder cup next year is when we do this year-end podcast next year i'm sure the Ryder cup is going to be the highlight for us as well uh, it's also Rome, so which leads very, very well to the next question, and, and this is for you specifically. Best meal of the year. So this is the one I had to reach out for. I have to say, Rex, it definitely was not the place that you and I tried to find for an hour in Pacific Palisades. I was going to try that, yeah. While I had a throbbing toothache that eventually became a root canal. That, that unfortunately <laughs> did not make best but who knows if that place actually existed if it didn't if it wasn't defunct as of like 2022 or excuse me 2012 uh then that certainly could have been my best meal in lieu of that i'm going with our media dinner at the tour championship a place called yibo ah. beach house i hope i'm not butchering that pronunciation in atlanta it was that south african flair they closed off a room for us I mean, it was unbelievable, folks. It had to have cost $10,000 on the same day. Of course, the media dinner was the same day that the PGA Tour announced all the, the elevated events and the $20 million purses. Phil Mickelson's popping off about, oh, where'd they find all the, all the reserve cash? Well, they found it, folks. They found it with, with, with ten dollars to $20,000 media dinners, uh, we, which we very much enjoyed on the PJ Tour comm staff. You and oh, I worked very so closely with them throughout the entire year. Incredibly appreciative of Thank all you, their Shooky. efforts. Thank you, Shooky. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Shooky. Uh, my boy, Stu Moore, uh, always hooking us up. Rachel, uh, Jack, the entire gang. I don't want to leave anybody. Tracy. Amanda, Tracy. Johnny uh, Bush. Johnny Bush. I mean, we're uh, Milne. Dougie. Uh, Mark, Mark, Mark Williams, now a U.S. citizen. Shout out, uh, Mark Williams. And so that, oh, nice. that's definitely the highlight for me. Best meal. It was unbelievable. Super appreciative of our comms friends. Oh, that one's good. Yeah, I, I, I totally blanked on that one. And as I stumbled that's through why, my memory. That's why I'm a, I'm a reporter. I did some research. Yeah, that, that was good. You, you did a better job because I stumbled through the places I ate in New Orleans because that was like we did. We talked two weeks about New Orleans, me being there, where I was going to eat, what I was going to drink. And like one place doesn't stand out because keep in mind, I was just in New Orleans three weeks ago or a few weeks ago. for And, I was, in, I, and I was in New Orleans in June with my dad. Yeah. So I don't want to take it like this is sort of I'm taking it for granted now because I'm sure I ate the best meal of the year somewhere in New Orleans. Didn't you have COVID like, during New Orleans? Uh, I caught it in New Orleans. I think I caught it. I, you know what? I, I caught. I know. Exactly Shocker. I, caught. I was I was walking home Saturday night and walked not down but across Bourbon Street, not down but across Bourbon Street, and I could smell the COVID just permeating <laughs> every part of my being. I, I feel like yes, this is where this is where it happened. It's, it's, it was like an island it of probably, misfit toys. It, it probably was not the only thing you caught uh, in New Orleans that week. Go on. We and, but we ate twice when uh, when I was in Memphis for that tournament, which was a very good tournament, by the way. Uh, and so I I'm going to go with the commissary, which is sort of a lame answer. But mm. I mean, we ate there two times that week, and I had two separate meals, and they were both divine. That's excellent. I be I believe when we did this podcast last year, I may have given the commissary. Uh, a shout out as well. I was distraught that you did not go to the barbecue shop uh, in Memphis while you were there. I, th I believe you have that on your travel calendar for 2023. So you can make some amends. I will send you a detailed itinerary of where you need to go and when you need to go there. Uh, and I fully expect Thanks. that you will follow it. I do. I have done extensive research on this. I gained, I literally gained nine pounds uh, when I went in 2021. Epic. Just an Give epic me food city. I'm throwing this one at you sideways, but give me your best drink of the year. I was thinking about this as well. Best drink of the year. Um, I don't think I was at a tournament. Nope. I take that back. I don't know what it was called, but we had this boot. Uh, I believe boot? you were late. Yeah, we had a DOS boot at St. Andrews. We oh, had it with yes. we had it with the bunk mate. It was like yeah, right. seventy something ounces. Uh, I don't know if it was the best drink, but it was like the best drinking experience that I had while on the road. That's gonna have to count. I mean, obviously, no, a no, rack, that was a little bar right down the street. I was with you guys. No, we we did. We yeah. No, we weren't did. you late? We, you were talking. To, you were talking to someone. Yeah, I maybe I was late. a little late. I'm not even, but I, re I remember. You got, you got Das boot. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it should come as no surprise that the bunkmate also was uh, the architect of my favorite drink. And here's the deal. So <laughs> Lauren LaCaba, who has been working at the Golf Channel now, I want to say, two or three years. And she's very, very good at her job. And she was my producer when I was in uh, Ireland for the Irish Open. And, and Lauren LaCaba is, is, I think she's mid-20s would be my guest. And so she's fresh out of college. Joe, Joe LaCaba's daughter, for those wondering. Joe yeah. LaCaba's daughter, uh, just to pick up the name off the floor. But there was something that my wife uh, had her drink that was like a Guinness, because again, we're in Ireland, and it was Irish whiskey, and I'm not quite sure what it was called. And then there was some sort of like a sweetener or cream in there, and it Ooh. was delicious. Oh, now, that it's fantastic. probably why I sound the way I sound right now, but yes, that's got to be my favorite drink. That's cheating. I didn't, I didn't get to go to Ireland uh, this year, although we were talking about it last night. get to go to Ireland. I know. We were talking about it last night. Then we were already making uh, plans. What the The next... Uh, open at Port Rush, I believe it's 2025. Has that been announced yet? Maybe it hasn't been announced. Who Sounds knows? Whenever, whenever, when, whenever it is, we're doing a couples trip, uh, doing Dublin beforehand, and then going up to Port Rush. Uh, it already cannot wait for that in a few years' time. If you've never been, just an absolutely wonderful country. Uh, so much to do, so much to experience. Let's go negative, Rex. Let's be super negative. pessimistic. Let's be super Debbie Downers. Biggest disappointment. Be as harsh as humanly possible here. Uh, this one was easy for me, Phil Mickelson, and I know that that's wow. Phil, Phil you and I are both. We both chose Phil. We finally we? we finally agreed on one, and and it just seems like it's low hanging fruit. We're kind of punching down on him at this point in time, to be quite honest with you. But when you look at the arc of his year, which is pretty much I feel like the arc of his legacy at this point, when you see how things unraveled in February with the comments that were on the Fire Pit Collective website and the story that he wrote about, where he blasted everyone, he blasted Liv Goff, he blasted the PGA no one Tour, was he spared. blasted Jim on. He blasted Greg Monahan. Yes, I mean he just he went scorched earth, and how he got from that point to where he is now, and and I don't know if he's better or worse. I don't know how his legacy endures this, but I don't. He, he didn't play well. You could tell like he was just out of his element when he did come back. He looked out of sorts, and this is a guy who two years ago when he wins the PGA Championship, you and I are like, man, like this is this is amazing. The, late in his career, he's done this. Loved beloved he, figure he's going to get whenever he transitions to tv he's going to be brilliant he's going to be our i don't know pick your poison he's gonna be our tony romo he's going to be our voice of golf like there were so many things to get excited about phil going forward and that it all unraveled and it imploded and maybe things come around maybe things change but i don't see how yeah i can't believe we agreed on this but we definitely do to me this was an obvious choice after he tarnished his legacy and shifted to the forefront of the movement to destroy the PGA Tour. There's clearly going to be some live supporters, but there's a lot more, at least PGA Tour defenders, at the moment. And that just not, did not sit well. The, the caustic comments that he made, to me, came off as manipulative, duplicitous, morally bankrupt. And once he came back and, and we saw him for the first time we didn't cover the first live event in london but when he we saw him a week later at the us open he just like looked hollow he looked dead inside he he sounded insincere and it was just such a far cry from where he was like literally 13 months earlier when he was on top of the world and everyone was praising phil uh for his legendary status and his longevity in the game. It's just amazing, Rex, to think of all that Phil Mickelson has given up by going to live for this reported $200 million signing bonus. The cushy gig in the TV booth, like you mentioned, a Ryder Cup captaincy. At least uh, one. Mo exactly. Most likely the ceremonial starter gig at the Masters. When you look at that uh, tersely worded statement uh, by Augusta National saying that live uh, players will be allowed to play in the 2023 Masters. Phil Mickelson was not mentioned by name, even though like 10 other legends of the game were mentioned. So I think that lets you know how Fred Ridley and company uh, think about Phil Mickelson at this time. I just don't think you can help but wonder um, if this was all worth it. Snapping yeah. your fingers at the dog Snapping doesn't help. Snapping the fingers at the dog. I, I, absolutely yeah. stupid dog. It's a visual medium now. Yeah. yeah, so just stop. So annoying. Uh, so, yes, big <laughs> disappointment for sure was Phil Mickelson. Let's do a personal one to round this one out, Rex. Best Sunday night on deadline and worse, of which there were probably many. Uh, well, this goes back to, I, and I didn't want to do the spoiler alert thing. Best was was the President's Cup for all the reasons you pointed out. Like it was a much much better week. I don't know. You said thirty. So are we are minutes. we talking are we talking about are we talking about 
best story we wrote on deadline or just best story to write? I would like to do this uh, personally. Best story you wrote on deadline, and then and then the worst. Oh, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying no. That I'm not going out on my limb. I'm going out on that limb and saying it's the best story I wrote. It was the best to write because, and I realized this. Like it's it's dawned on me since then. Like we always end up talking about whatever team event was that year, Ryder Cup, Presidents Cup, and it suddenly dawned on me this year why. It's because we're not just talking about one winner. There's twelve winners. And so it's times 12, the happiness and the good cheer and, and the opportunity for good quotes and good sound bites. And the opposite is true. We're not writing about just one loser. We're writing about 12 losers and the emotions. <laughs> oh, that oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> give, me, give me all the grief. <laughs> That's right. And, and it was all there. I mean, for and I think you and I both sort of experienced this to see the look on Trevor Immelman's face. After having gone through this for three years because of COVID, he, he kind of got the extra year that he so he spent a, a good portion of the last three years focused on this and what he was focused on unraveled so quickly and right on the doorstep of this year's matches with Cam Smith and Mark Leishman going to live golf and him losing him from the team. Just the emotions you, you factor in Tom Kim, you factor you said 30 to 45 minutes of hope on Sunday. I think that's that's a little that's a little stretch. I think it might have been 15 to 20 minutes. But you're right. They at least gave it a window of, oh, if things start falling their way, this could happen. I, I just love at least the content. I'm not sure I love the story that I wrote, but I love the content. Oh, I remember the story I wrote. It was absolutely dreadful. Um, mm. I'm not sure which one your best one was mm. on deadline. Perhaps when I give this answer, uh, you can start thinking. Uh, I'll, I'll answer this one personally then. For me, we, we, you always mention that I'm like the grief eater. And so like my number one highlight was Mito Pereira at the PGA Championship uh, writing that story. I felt, nom, nom, I, nom, felt, nom. I felt incredibly prepared had, had Mito Pereira won that tournament. Um, I had a lot of good background that I've been working on for like the previous 48 hours, uh, uh, thinking that he could potentially win, and we really didn't know all that much about him. And then kind of having to shift the tone of it and make it more – of a backdrop to uh, the disappointing 72nd hole that he had and missing out on the playoff of by one shot was at least uh, not not for Mito obviously but for but for me was a, was a highlight. We always try to humanize the athletes uh, that we cover and when these guys have 10 15 minutes to debrief what is a crushing disappointment um, I'm always curious how those athletes handle that and what kind of lessons we can draw from them. So that was a highlight for me. Uh, Cam Smith and Rory at the Open Championship. Another shout-out, Bunkmate. You and I did the podcast immediately after. And that was your that best? One. That's funny. Is uh, that one your of best? Them. One of them. Oh, what, oh wow. All right. try, trying to piece those two parallel stories together. We had some good stuff. Uh, seeing Rory crying on Erica's shoulder uh, while getting shuttled uh, out of the media area uh, was a highlight. How about worst, Rex? What was your worst Sunday night on deadline? It, it's the Open. Which is why I thought that was funny. really and, and uh, well, it was a combination of things. <laughs> was, she just, felt... was she just a little distracting for you? Yes, yes, she was. If we're being honest, and and then in, in her defense, and we were also doing podcasts every night. So like we did this new experiment, and you guys said you wanted the podcast every night after play finished at the major. Give the people what they want. And that's great. I think we thoroughly enjoyed it. Hopefully the, the listeners thoroughly enjoyed it as well. For a writer on deadline, that is the worst possible, at least for me personally, like. I'm I'm in the flow coming from the golf course. You're right. You see all these great scenes. You you know you have a chance to talk to the winner. You have a chance to talk to the loser. You start getting in a flow. You start getting ideas. The next thing you know, someone sticks a microphone in your face. And it's all right. I talk time. Talky now. You you talk for 15, 20 minutes, and and then you factor in the bunk mate being there. And it was a little cramped. We had a lot. Of, we had a lot of people watching us, and it just was not a comfortable experience for me. Bunk bait with some whiskey, bunk bait with some gin and tonics, bunk bait with yes. some beer, bunk bait with some wine. Uh, she was just impervious, <laughs> impervious to our deadline struggles all the same. Although I must say, I really did enjoy the game story. I was, I was just looking through that uh, the other day. For me, worse. I can't believe you didn't go this direction because you and I were literally standing next to each other that this happened. It was Augusta National, the Masters, and trying to get Scotty oh, Scheffler's yeah. family after he won. Ooh. I was already in kind of a... a a, a, a poor uh, state of mind at this point. I'd already written like 1,800 words, kind of wrapping up Tigers, what I thought was a heroic effort uh, to make the cut at the Masters. So I was already kind of tapped out mentally from that one. I kept striking out left and right, trying to get people close to Scotty's orbit uh, <laughs> after uh, the Butler 
cabin ceremony and the green jacket ceremony on the practice putting green. I kept missing guys. And so I was, I was getting increasingly frustrated. And in the winner's press conference, I'm sure you guys remember this guy, he told this great anecdote of how he was crying on Sunday morning in a fetal his, position in the kitchen <laughs> and, and his wife kind of uh, gave him the pep talk that he needed that eventually became a runaway victory and his first major championship victory at Augusta national. It was a great story. And so as reporters, we want to not just corroborate that story, but expand on it. We want, we want even more anecdotes. We want even more details. And, and so Rex and I went behind <laughs> the media building, which apparently, apparently, I didn't see any uh, sort of signs uh, indicating this, but apparently that is off limits to media members. We were told by an Augusta National representative that the family uh, was not doing any interviews. I am still skeptical, Rex. When we were recording this late December 2022, that the family members were even asked for an interview request. So that was definitely uh, my hurt. worst Sunday night yeah. on deadline. No, I felt like we had the, I felt like we had the goods. We were in position. We were hustling, writing for the internet. We don't have a crazy deadline like some of our uh, friends in the newspaper business. We were in position, and we were stiff armed. We were absolutely Heisman, and that one hurt. That I'm still yeah. bitter. I'm still bitter to this day. No, that that one hurt. You're right because that's that's where we kind of do our reporting in in those circles. Like it's not you're not getting the gold when you're sitting in a press conference. You're you're trying to go around the edges. So yeah, that that one definitely hurt because I don't know. We should ask Scott if you if someone asked him. I don't know. Maybe one of us should ask Scott. Uh, we're definitely gonna ask Scott. Uh, that is one of our early missions in 2023. One of the one of the things that we try and do, not just on the podcast, but writing for stories for GolfChannel.com, is we want to give readers, listeners, details that they can't get anywhere else. We were in position. I'm never going to let this go. In fact, uh, I may just lodge a formal complaint. Sausage fingers up. I know, and I, it's sort of a, a runner-up here was you and I both, I think, in L.A. because we were both there on Sunday. And you know, Joaquin won. Oh, and dreadful. Everything, everything was happening with Joaquin, and both of us watched Tiger literally bound up the stairs. I think there's 96 stairs from the 18th green to the clubhouse. I mean, it's quite the climb. And you and I both are wide-eyed watching him. And like, I think we both looked at each other at the same time with the, I'd really like to write that. <laughs> one, of us, one of us needs to write that. I did. And I, I, wrote, you I, did. Wrote 700, I wrote 700 words. I don't even think I wrote. Uh, live on Sunday night uh, at Riviera, which was kind of shocking. We did what uh, what used to be known as Writer's Block, which was like a 15, 20 minute video segment afterward. I don't even think I wrote live. I just focused on the Monday scramble, which is what you kind of have to do when you have a four or five, six shot, whatever it was, victory yeah. by Joaquin Neiman and something that wasn't going to resonate all that much with our audience. Now that was a ton of fun, Rex. Look forward to doing the season preview in, oh, I don't know, like 20 hours from now. I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this in incredibly brief off season before the PG tour kicks off again, at Kapalua the first week of January. I, I must say, although our golf calendars are absolutely packed wrecks and it feels like we don't have all that much of a break. I think I'm ready for the, the PG tour season to begin again. I don't know what we would do if we had like a dedicated off season where literally things went dark for three or four months. Obviously, I think the anticipation would be off the charts, uh, but I also think that I would drive myself positively insane if we didn't have something to talk about. I'm not sure you and I would, would have jobs. Uh, Congaree was a long time ago. I, I can see what's happening. You, yeah. you're, you're running around the house. You're trying to find things to fix. December, I, I what's happening here. The month, the month of December, like everyone's been sick. Like I'm ready, I'm ready to kick this thing off and have golf to focus on. I do think, Rex, and we'll get into this obviously in the season preview podcast. I do think more focus will be on the golf in 2023 than it was in 2022, which seemed I'll to take be that really bet. focused on the disruption. Uh, I'll take that bet. I mean, do you think Live Golf and these lawsuits are going to go somewhere? Do you think someone? I don't do you think Greg Norman is suddenly going to stop talking. No, I don't think it's going to go away. But I don't think we're going to have. When we're, at, when we're at tournaments, I think we would actually be covering the golf as opposed to listening to the rumor mill, trying to hunt down various rumors, talking about what every player thinks about Liv. Like, I, I don't think we're going to have that in 2023, which will be a, a welcome departure. I do think there's – obviously, there's going to be a torrent of news related to Liv, but I don't think it's going to be kind of the gossipy stuff that we were dealing with in 2022. If I sound this bad in the post Christmas podcast, what do you think I'm going to sound like on January 2nd on, in the post New Year's Eve podcast? 
Like, oh, if, <laughs> yeah. If you if you if you sound awful. like this, if you sound like this on January second, we need to call a doctor because you're clearly dying. I'm uh, sure it's going to be worse at that point, and you'll be celebrating or mourning one way or the other, a win or a loss. Oh, I, yeah, I could be. I just could be incredibly dour uh, on the first podcast of 2023. But I I, I do want to uh, thank Rex, all of not just our. Uh, readers on GolfChannel.com, all the listeners here with the Golf Central Podcast presented by Callaway Golf, supporting us uh, throughout 2022. We're excited about some of the progress we made, some of the technological advances. We're planning on doing even a little bit more in 2023. If you can believe that, a, a Goliath of a company like Golf Channel and NBC Sports will be doing even more with uh, this digital video and audio space. So thank you guys so much. Bottoms of our heart for supporting us this year. Can't wait to do it all over again in, I don't know, like 24 or 48 hours. Peace. Thanks, guys.